Preface, The Myth in 1815, Germany's General Music Journal published a letter in which Mozart described his creative process. One when I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone, and of good cheer, say traveling in a carriage, or walking after a good meal, or during the night when I cannot sleep. It is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. All this fires my soul, and provided I am not disturbed, my subject enlarges itself becomes methodized and defined, and the whole, though it be long, stands almost finished and complete in my mind, so that I can survey it, like a fine picture or a beautiful statue, at a glance. Nor do I hear in my imagination the parts successively, but I hear them, as it were, all at once. When I proceed to write down my ideas the committing to paper is done quickly enough, for everything is, as I said before, already finished, and it rarely differs on paper from what it was in my imagination. In other words, Mozart's greatest symphonies, concertos, and operas came to him complete when he was alone and in a good mood. He needed no tools to compose them. Once he had finished imagining his masterpieces, all he had to do was write them down. This letter has been used to explain creation many times. Parts of it appear in The Mathematician's Mind, written by Jacques Hadamard in 1945. In Creativity, Selected Readings, edited by Philip Vernon in 1976, in Roger Penrose's award-winning 1989 book, the Emperor's New Mind, and it is alluded to in Jonah Lehrer's 2012 bestseller Imagine. It influenced the poets Pushkin and Goethe and the playwright Peter Schaffer. Directly and indirectly, it helped shape common beliefs about creating. But there is a problem. Mozart did not write this letter. It is a forgery. This was first shown in 1856 by Mozart's biographer Otto John and has been confirmed by other scholars since. Mozart's real letters, to his father, to his sister, and to others, reveal his true creative process too he was exceptionally talented but he did not write by magic. He sketched his compositions, revised them, and sometimes got stuck. He could not work without a piano or harpsichord. He would set work aside and return to it later. He considered theory and craft while writing, and he thought a lot about rhythm, melody, and harmony. Even though his talent and a lifetime of practice made him fast and fluent, his work was exactly that, work. Masterpieces did not come to him complete in uninterrupted streams of imagination, nor without an instrument, nor did he write them down whole and unchanged. The letter is not only forged, it is false. It lives on because it appeals to romantic prejudices about invention. There is a myth about how something new comes to be. Geniuses have dramatic moments of insight where great things and thoughts are born whole. Poems are written in dreams. Symphonies are composed complete. Science is accomplished with eureka shrieks. Businesses are built by magic touch. Something is not, then is. We do not see the road from nothing to new, and maybe we do not want to. Artistry must be misty magic, not sweat and grind. It dulls the luster to think that every elegant equation, beautiful painting, and brilliant machine is born of effort and error, the progeny of false starts and failures, and that each maker is as flawed, small, and mortal as the rest of us. It is seductive to conclude that great innovation is delivered to us by miracle via genius. And so the myth, the myth has shaped how we think about creating for as long as creating has been thought about. In ancient civilizations, people believed that things could be discovered but not created. For them, everything had already been created. They shared the perspective of Carl Sagan's joke on this topic. If you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. In the Middle Ages, creation was possible but was reserved for divinity and those with divine inspiration. In the Renaissance, humans were finally thought capable of creation, but they had to be great men, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Botticelli, and the like. As the 19th century turned into the 20th, creating became a subject for philosophical, then psychological investigation. The question being investigated was how do the great men do it? And the answer had the residue of medieval divine intervention. A lot of the meat of the myth was added at this time, with the same few anecdotes about epiphanies and genius, including hoaxes like Mozart's letter, being circulated and recirculated. In 1926, Alfred North Whitehead made a noun from a verb and gave the myth its name. Creativity 3 The creativity myth implies that few people can be creative, that any successful creator will experience dramatic flashes of insight, and that creating is more like magic than work. A rare few have what it takes, and for them it comes easy. Anybody else's creative efforts are doomed. How to fly a horse is about why the myth is wrong. I believed the myth until 1999, my early career, at London University student newspaper, at a Bloomsbury noodle startup called Wagamama, and at a soap and paper company called Procter & Gamble suggested that I was not good at creating. I struggled to execute my ideas. When I tried, people got angry. When I succeeded, they forgot that the idea was mine. 
I read every book I could find about creation, and each one said the same thing. Ideas come magically, people greet them warmly, and creators are winners. My ideas came gradually, people greeted them with heat instead of warmth, and I felt like a loser. My performance reviews were bad. I was always in danger of being fired. I could not understand why my creative experiences were not like the ones in the books. It first occurred to me that the books might be wrong in 1997, when I was trying to solve an apparently boring problem that turned out to be interesting. I could not keep a popular shade of Procter & Gamble lipstick on store shelves. Half of all stores were out of stock at any given time. After much research, I discovered that the cause of the problem was insufficient information. The only way to see what was on a shelf at any moment was to go look. This was a fundamental limit of 20th century information technology. Almost all the data entered into computers in the 1,900 seconds came from people typing on keyboards or, sometimes, scanning barcodes. Store workers did not have time to stare at shelves all day, then enter data about what they saw. So every store's computer system was blind. Shopkeepers did not discover that my lipstick was out of stock. Shoppers did. The shoppers shrugged and picked a different one, in which case I probably lost the sale or they did not buy lipstick at all, in which case the store lost the sale, too. The missing lipstick was one of the world's smallest problems, but it was a symptom of one of the world's biggest problems. Computers were brains without senses. This was so obvious that few people noticed it. Computers were 50 years old in 1997. Most people had grown up with them and had grown used to how they worked. Computers processed data that people entered. As their name confirmed, computers were regarded as thinking machines, not sensing machines. But this is not how intelligent machines were originally conceived. In 1950, Alan Turing, computing's inventor, wrote, Machines will eventually compete with men in all purely intellectual fields, but which are the best ones to start with. Many people think that a very abstract activity, like the playing of chess, would be best. It can also be maintained that it is best to provide the machine with the best sense organs that money can buy. Both approaches should be tried, yet few people tried that second approach. In the 20th century, computers got faster and smaller and were connected together. But they did not get the best sense organs that money can buy. They did not get any sense organs at all. And so in May 1997, a computer called Deep Blue could beat the reigning human chess world champion, Garry Kasparov, for the first time ever. But there was no way a computer could see if a lipstick was on a shelf. This was the problem I wanted to solve. I put a tiny radio microchip into a lipstick and an antenna into a shelf. This, under the catch-all name storage system, became my first patented invention. The microchip saved money and memory by connecting to the internet, newly public in the 1990s, and saving its data there. To help Procter & Gamble executives understand this system for connecting things like lipstick and diapers, laundry detergent, potato chips, or any other object, to the internet, I gave it a short and ungrammatical name, the Internet of Things. To help make it real, I started working with Sanjay Sarma, David Brock, and Sonny Sue at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 1999, we co-founded a research center, and I emigrated from England to the United States to become its executive director. In 2003, our research had 103 corporate sponsors, plus additional labs in universities in Australia, China, England, Japan, and Switzerland and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology signed a lucrative license deal to make our technology commercially available. In 2013, my phrase Internet of Things was added to the Oxford Dictionaries, which defined it as a proposed development of the Internet in which everyday objects have network connectivity, allowing them to send and receive data. Nothing about this experience resembled the stories in the creativity books I had read. There was no magic, and there had been few flashes of inspiration, just tens of thousands of hours of work. Building the Internet of Things was slow and hard, fraught with politics, infested with mistakes, unconnected to grand plans or strategies. I learned to succeed by learning to fail. I learned to expect conflict. I learned not to be surprised by adversity but to prepare for it. I used what I discovered to help build technology businesses. One was named one of the 10 most innovative companies in the Internet of Things in 2014, and two were sold to bigger companies. One less than a year after I started it. I also gave talks about my experiences of creating. My most popular talk attracted so many people with so many questions that, each time I gave it, I had to plan to stay for at least an hour afterward to answer questions from audience members. That talk is the foundation of this book. Each chapter tells the true story of a creative person. Each story comes from a different place, time, and creative field and highlights an important insight about creating. There are tales within the tales and departures into science, history, and philosophy. Taken together, the stories reveal a pattern for how humans make new things. 
one that is both encouraging and challenging. The encouraging part is that everyone can create, and we can show that fairly conclusively. The challenging part is that there is no magic moment of creation. Creators spend almost all their time creating, persevering despite doubt, failure, ridicule, and rejection until they succeed in making something new and useful. There are no tricks, shortcuts, or get creative quick schemes. The process is ordinary, even if the outcome is not. Creating is not magic but work. Chapter 1 Creating is ORDI Nun Peso. Edmund in the Indian Ocean. 1,500 miles east of Africa and 4,000 miles west of Australia, lies an island that the Portuguese knew as Santa Polonia, the British as Bourbon, and the French, for a time, as Isle Bonaparte. Today it is called Reunion. A bronze statue stands in St. Suzanne, one of Reunion's oldest towns One, it shows an African boy in 1841, dressed as if for church, in a single-breasted jacket, bow tie, and flat front pants that gather on the ground. He wears no shoes. He holds out his right hand, not in greeting but with his thumb and fingers coiled against his palm, perhaps about to flip a coin. He is twelve years old, an orphan and a slave, and his name is Edmund. The world has few statues of Africa's enslaved children. To understand why Edmund stands here, on this lonely ocean speck, his hand held just so. We must travel west and back, thousands of miles and hundreds of years. On Mexico's Gulf Coast, the people of Papantla have dried the fruit of a vine-like orchid and used it as a spice for more millennia than they remember too in 14.0. The Aztecs took it as tax and called it black flower. In 1519, the Spanish introduced it to Europe and called it little pod, or vanilla. In 1703, French botanist Charles Plumier renamed it vanilla. Vanilla is hard to farm. Vanilla orchids are great creeping plants, not at all like the Phalaenopsis flowers we put in our homes. They can live for centuries and grow large sometimes covering thousands of square feet or climbing five stories high. It has been said that lady slippers are the tallest orchids and tigers the most massive. But vanilla dwarfs them both. For thousands of years, its flower was a secret known only to the people who grew it. It is not black, as the Aztecs were led to believe, but a pale tube that blooms once a year and dies in a morning. If a flower is pollinated, it produces a long, green, bean-like capsule that takes nine months to ripen. It must be picked at precisely the right time. Too soon and it will be too small, too late and it will split and spoil. Hick beans are left in the sun for days, until they stop ripening. They do not smell of vanilla yet. That aroma develops during curing, two weeks on wool blankets outdoors each day before being wrapped to sweat each night. Then the beans are dried for four months and finished by hand with straightening and massage. The result is oily black lashes worth their weight in silver or gold. Vanilla captivated the Europeans. Anne of Austria, daughter of Spain's King Philip III, drank it in hot chocolate. Queen Elizabeth I of England ate it in puddings. King Henry IV of France made adulterating it a criminal offense punishable by a beating. Thomas Jefferson discovered it in Paris and wrote America's first recipe for vanilla ice cream, but no one outside Mexico could make it grow. For 300 years, vines transported to Europe would not flower. It was only in 1806 that vanilla first bloomed in a London greenhouse, and three more decades before a plant in Belgium bore Europe's first fruit. The missing ingredient was whatever pollinated the orchid in the wild. The flower in London was a chance occurrence. The fruit in Belgium came from complicated artificial pollination. It was not until late in the 19th century that Charles Darwin inferred that a Mexican insect must be vanilla's pollinator, and not until late in the 20th century that the insect was identified as a glossy green bee called Euglossa viridissima. Without the pollinator, Europe had a problem. Demand for vanilla was increasing, but Mexico was producing only one or two tons a year. The Europeans needed another source of supply. The Spanish hoped vanilla would thrive in the Philippines. The Dutch planted it in Java. The British sent it to India. All attempts failed. This is where Edmund enters. He was born in St. Susan in 1829. At that time Reunion was called Bourbon. His mother, Melice, died in childbirth. He did not know his father. Slaves did not have last names. He was simply Edmund. When Edmund was a few years old, his owner, Elvire Bellier Beaumont, gave him to her brother Ferial in nearby Bellevue. Ferial owned a plantation. Edmund grew up following Ferial Bellier Beaumont around the estate, learning about its fruits, vegetables, and flowers, including one of its oddities. A vanilla vine Ferial had kept alive since 1822. Like all the vanilla on Reunion, Ferial's vine was sterile. French colonists had been trying to grow the plant on the island since 1819. After a few false starts, some orchids were the wrong species. Some soon died. They eventually had a hundred live vines. But Reunion saw no more success with vanilla than Europe's other colonies had. The orchid seldom flowered and never bore fruit. Then, one morning late in 1841, as the spring of the Southern Hemisphere came to the island, Ferial took his customary walk with Edmund and was surprised to find two green capsules hanging from the vine. His orchid, barren for twenty years, had fruit. 
What came next surprised him even more. Twelve-year-old Edmund said he had pollinated the plant himself. To this day there are people in Reunion who do not believe it. It seems impossible to them that a child, a slave, and, above all, an African, could have solved the problem that beat Europe for hundreds of years. They say it was an accident, that he was trying to damage the flowers after an argument with Ferial, or he was busy seducing a girl in the gardens when it happened. Ferial did not believe the boy at first, but when more fruit appeared, days later, he asked for a demonstration. Edmund pulled back the lip of a vanilla flower and, using a toothpick-sized piece of bamboo to lift the part that prevents self-fertilization. He gently pinched its pollen-bearing anther and pollen-receiving stigma together. Today the French call this le geste d'Edmund, Edmund's gesture. Ferial called the other plantation owners together, and soon Edmund was traveling the island teaching other slaves how to pollinate vanilla orchids. After seven years, Reunion's annual production was a hundred pounds of dried vanilla pods. After ten years, it was two tons. By the end of the century, it was two hundred tons and had surpassed the output of Mexico. Ferial freed Edmund in June 1848 six months before most of Reunion's other slaves. Edmund was given the last name Albius, the Latin word for whiter. Some suspect this was a compliment in racially charged Reunion. Others think it was an insult from the naming registry. Whatever the intention, things went badly. Edmund left the plantation for the city and was imprisoned for theft. Ferial was unable to prevent the incarceration but succeeded in getting Edmund released after three years instead of five. Edmund died in 1880 at the age of 51. A small story in a Reunion newspaper, Le Moniteur, described it as a destitute and miserable end. Edmund's innovation spread to Mauritius, the Seychelles, and the huge island to Reunion's west, Madagascar. Madagascar has a perfect environment for vanilla. By the 20th century, it was producing most of the world's vanilla, with a crop that in some years was worth more than $100 million. The demand for vanilla increased with the supply. Today it is the world's most popular spice and, after saffron, the second most expensive. It has become an ingredient in thousands of things, some obvious, some not. Over a third of the world's ice cream is Jefferson's original flavor. Vanilla. Vanilla is the principal flavoring in Coke, and the Coca-Cola company is said to be the world's largest vanilla buyer. The fine fragrances Chanel know. 5. Opium. An angel used the world's most expensive vanilla, worth $10,000 a pound. Most chocolate contains vanilla. So do many cleaning products, beauty products and candles. In 1841, on the day of Edmund's demonstration to Ferial, the world produced fewer than 2,000 vanilla beans, all in Mexico, all the result of pollination by bees. On the same day in 2010, the world produced more than 5 million vanilla beans. In countries including Indonesia, China, and Kenya, almost all of them, including the ones grown in Mexico, the result of Legeste Edmund. 2. Counting creators What is unusual about Edmund's story is not that a young slave created something important but that he got the credit for it. Ferial worked hard to ensure that Edmund was remembered. He told Reunion's plantation owners that it was Edmund who first pollinated vanilla. He lobbied on Edmund's behalf, saying, This young Negro deserves recognition from this country. It owes him a debt for starting up a new industry with a fabulous product. When Jean Mitchell Claude Richard, director of Reunion's Botanical Gardens, said he had developed the technique and shown it to Edmund, Ferial intervened. Through old age, faulty memory or some other cause, he wrote, Mr. Richard now imagines that he himself discovered the secret of how to pollinate vanilla, and imagines that he taught the technique to the person who discovered it. Let us leave him to his fantasies. Without Ferial's great effort, the truth would have been lost. In most cases, the truth has been lost. We do not know, for example, who first realized that the fruit of an orchid could be cured until it tastes good. Vanilla is an innovation inherited from people long forgotten. This is not exceptional, it is normal. Most of our world is made of innovations inherited from people long forgotten. Not people who were rare but people who were common. Before the Renaissance, concepts like authorship, inventorship, or claiming credit barely existed. Until the early 15th century, author meant father, from the Latin word for master. Octor. Octorship implied authority, something that, in most of the world, had been the divine right of kings and religious leaders since Gilgamesh ruled Uruk 4,000 years earlier. It was not to be shared with mere mortals. An inventor, from Invenire, find, was a discoverer. Not a creator, until the 1550s. Credit, from Credo, trust, did not mean acknowledgement until the late 16th century. This is one reason we know so little about who made what before the late 1300 seconds. It is not that no records were made, writing has been around for millennia, nor is it that there was no creation. Everything we use today has roots stretching back to the beginning of humanity. The problem is that, until the Renaissance, people who created things didn't matter much. The idea that at least some people who create things should be recognized was a big step forward. 
It is why we know that Johannes Gutenberg invented printing in Germany in 1440 but not who invented windmills in England in 1185, and that Gianta Pisano painted the crucifix in Bologna's Basilica of San Domenico in 1250 but not who made the mosaic of St. Demetrios in Kiev's Golden Domed Monastery in 1110. There are exceptions. We know the names of hundreds of ancient Greek philosophers, from Acrian to Zeno, as well as a few Greek engineers of the same period, such as Eupolinos, Philo, and C. Tezebius. We also know of a number of Chinese artists from around 400 degrees Celsius, e. onward, including the calligrapher Wai Shuo and her student Wang Zizhai. But the general principle holds. Broadly speaking, our knowledge of who created what started around the middle of the 13th century, increased during the European Renaissance of the 14th to 17th centuries, and has kept increasing ever since. The reasons for the change are complicated and the subject of debate among historians. They include power struggles within the churches of Europe, the rise of science, and the rediscovery of ancient philosophy. But there is little doubt that most creators started getting credit for their creations only after the year 1200. One way this happened was through patents, which give credit within rigorous constraints. The first patents were issued in Italy in the 15th century, in Britain and the United States in the 17th century, and in France in the 18th century. The modern U.S. Patent and Trademark Office granted its first patent on July 31, 1790.3. It granted its 8 millionth patent on August 16, 2011. The Patent Office does not keep records of how many different people have been granted patents, but economist Manuel Trajtenberg developed a way of working it out for he analyzed names phonetically and compared matches with zip codes, coin vendors, and other information to identify each unique inventor. Trajtenberg's data suggests that more than 6 million distinct individuals had received U.S patents by the end of 2011. The inventors are not distributed evenly across the years five their numbers are increasing. The first million inventors took 130 years to get their patents, the second million 35 years, the third million 22 years, the fourth million 17 years, the fifth million 10 years, and the sixth million inventors took eight years. Even with foreign inventors removed and adjustments for population increase, the trend is unmistakable six in 180. About one in every 175,000 Americans was granted a first patent. In 2000, one in every 4,000 Americans received one. Not all creations get a patent. Books, songs, plays, movies, and other works of art are protected by copyright instead, which in the United States is managed by the Copyright Office. Part of the Library of Congress, copyrights show the same growth as patents. In 1870, 5,600 works were registered for copyright 7 in 1886. The number grew to more than 31,000, and Ainsworth Spofford, the Librarian of Congress, had to plead for more space. Again it becomes necessary to refer to the difficulty and embarrassment of prosecuting the annual enumeration of the books and pamphlets recently completed, he wrote in a report to Congress. Each year and each month adds to the painfully overcrowded condition of the collections. And although many rooms have been filled with the overflow from the main library, the difficulty of handling so large an accumulation of unshelved books is constantly growing. This became a refrain. In 1946, Register of Copyright Sam Bass Warner reported that the number of registrations of copyright claims rose to 202,144, the greatest number in the history of the Copyright Office, and a number so far beyond the capacities of the existing staff that Congress, responding to the need, generously provided for additional personnel aid in 1991. Copyright registrations reached a peak of more than 600,000. As with patents, the increase exceeded population growth. In 1870, there was one copyright registration for every 7,000 U.S. citizens 9 in 1991. There was one copyright registration for every 400 U.S. citizens. More credit is given for creation in science, too. The Science Citation Index tracks the world's leading peer-reviewed journals in science and technology. For 1955, the index lists 125,000 new scientific papers, about one for every 1,350 U.S citizens. For 2005, it lists more than 1,250,000 scientific papers, one for every 250 U.S. citizens' 10 patents, copyrights, and peer-reviewed papers are imperfect proxies. Their growth is driven by money as well as knowledge. Not all work that gets this recognition is necessarily good. And, as we shall see later, giving credit to individuals is misleading. Creation is a chain reaction. Thousands of people contribute, most of them anonymous all of them creative. But, with numbers so big, and even though we miscount and undercount, the point is hard to miss. Over the last few centuries, 
More people from more fields have been getting more credit as creators. We have not become more creative. The people of the Renaissance were born into a world enriched by tens of thousands of years of human invention. Clothes. Cathedrals. Mathematics. Writing. Art. Agriculture. Ships. Roads. Pets. Houses. Bread. And beer. To name a fraction, the second half of the 20th century and the first decades of the 21st century may appear to be a time of unprecedented innovation, but there are other reasons for this and we will discuss them later. What the numbers show is something else. When we start counting creators, we find that a lot of people create. In 2011, almost as many Americans received their first patent as attended a typical NASCAR race 11 creating is not for an elite few. It is not even close to being for an elite few. The question is not whether invention is the sole province of a tiny minority, but the opposite. How many of us are creative? The answer, hidden in plain sight, is all of us. Resistance to the possibility that Edmund, a boy with no formal education, could create something important is grounded in the myth that creating is extraordinary. Creating is not extraordinary, even if its results sometimes are. Creation is human. It is all of us. It is everybody. 3. The species of new even without numbers. It is easy to see that creation is not the exclusive domain of rare geniuses with occasional inspiration. Creation surrounds us. Everything we see and feel is a result of it or has been touched by it. There is too much creation for creating to be infrequent. This book is creation. You probably heard about it via creation, or the person who told you about it did. It was written using creation, and creation is one reason you can understand it. You are either lit by creation now or you will be, come sundown. You are heated or cooled or at least insulated by creation, by clothes and walls and windows. The sky above you is softened by fumes and smog in the day and polluted by electric light at night. All results of creation. Watch, and it will be crossed by an airplane or a satellite or the slow dissolve of a vapor trail. Apples, cows, and all other things agricultural, apparently natural, are also creation. The result of tens of thousands of years of innovation in trading, breeding, feeding, farming, and, unless you live on the farm, preservation and transportation, you are a result of creation. It helped your parents meet. It likely assisted your birth, gestation, and maybe conception. Before you were born, it eradicated diseases and dangers that could have killed you. After, it inoculated and protected you against others. It treated the illnesses you caught. It helps heal your wounds and relieve your pain. It did the same for your parents and their parents. It recently cleaned you, fed you, and quenched your thirst. It is why you are where you are. Cars, shoes, saddles, or ships transported you, your parents, or your grandparents to the place you now call home, which was less habitable before creation. Too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter or too wet or too swampy or too far from potable water or freely growing food or prowled by predators or all of the above. Listen, and you hear creation. It is in the sound of passing sirens, distant music, church bells, cell phones, lawn mowers and snow blowers, basketballs and bicycles, waves on breakers, hammers and saws, the creak and crackle of melting ice cubes, even the bark of a dog, a wolf changed by millennia of selective breeding by humans, or the purr of a cat, the descendant of one of just five African wildcats that humans have been selectively breeding for 10,000 years 12 anything that is as it is due to conscious human intervention is invention. Creation. New. Creation is so around and inside us that we cannot look without seeing it or listen without hearing it. As a result, we do not notice it at all. We live in symbiosis with new. It is not something we do, it is something we are. It affects our life expectancy, our height and weight and gait, our way of life. Where we live, and the things we think and do, we change our technology, and our technology changes us. This is true for every human being on the planet. It has been true for 2,000 generations. Ever since the moment our species started thinking about improving its tools, anything we create is a tool, a fabrication with purpose. There is nothing special about species with tools. Beavers make dams, birds build nests, dolphins use sponges to hunt for fish, 13 chimpanzees use sticks to dig for roots and stone hammers to open hard-shelled food. Otters use rocks to break open crabs. Elephants repel flies by making branches into switches they wave with their trunks. Clearly our tools are better. The Hoover Dam beats the Beaver Dam. But why? Our tools have not been better for long. Six million years ago, evolution forked. One path led to chimpanzees, distant relatives, but the closest living ones we have. The other path led to us. Unknown numbers of human species emerged. There was Homo habilis, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo ergester, Homo rudolfensis, and many others, some whose status is still controversial, some still to be discovered. All human, none us, like other species these humans used tools. The earliest were pointed stones used to cut nuts, fruit, and maybe meat. Later, some human species made two-sided hand axes requiring careful masonry and nearly perfect symmetry. But apart from minor adjustments, 
human tools were monotonous for a million years. Unchanged no matter when or where they were used, passed through 25,000 generations without modification 14 despite the mental focus needed to make it. The design of that early human hand axe, like the design of a beaver dam or bird's nest, came from instinct, not thought. Humans that looked like us first appeared 200,000 years ago. This was the species called Homo sapiens. Members of Homo sapiens did not act like us in one important way. Their tools were simple and did not change. We do not know why. Their brains were the same size as ours. They had our opposable thumbs, our senses, and our strength. Yet for 150,000 years, like the other human species of their time, they made nothing new. Then, 50,000 years ago, something happened. The crude, barely recognizable stone tools Homo sapiens had been using began to change, and change quickly. Until this moment, this species, like all other animals, did not innovate. Their tools were the same as their parents' tools and their grandparents' tools and their great-grandparents' tools. They made them, but they didn't make them better. The tools were inherited, instinctive, and immutable, products of evolution, not conscious creation. Then came by far the most important moment in human history. The day one member of the species looked at a tool and thought, I can make this better. The descendants of this individual are called Homo sapiens sapiens. They are our ancestors. They are us. What the human race created was creation itself. The ability to change anything was the change that changed everything. The urge to make better tools gave us a massive advantage over all other species, including rival species of humans. Within a few tens of thousands of years, all other humans were extinct, displaced by an anatomically similar species with only one important difference, ever-improving technology. What makes our species different and dominant is innovation. What is special about us is not the size of our brains, speech, or the mere fact that we use tools. It is that each of us is in our own way driven to make things better. We occupy the evolutionary niche of new. The niche of new is not the property of a privileged few. It is what makes humans human. We do not know exactly what evolutionary spark caused the ignition of innovation 50,000 years ago. It left no trace in the fossil record. We do know that our bodies, including our brain size, did not change. Our immediate pre-innovation ancestor, Homo sapiens, looked exactly like us. That makes the prime suspect our mind, the precise arrangement of, and connections between, our brain cells. Something structural seems to have changed there, perhaps as a result of 150,000 years of fine-tuning. Whatever it was, it had profound implications, and today it lives on in everyone. Behavioral neurologist Richard Caselli says, despite great qualitative and quantitative differences between individuals. The neurobiologic principles of creative behavior are the same from the least to the most creative among us. 15 put simply, we all have creative minds. This is one reason the creativity myth is so terribly wrong. Creating is not rare. We are all born to do it. If it seems magical, it is because it is innate. If it seems like some of us are better at it than others, that is because it is part of being human, like talking or walking. We are not all equally creative just as we are not all equally gifted orators or athletes, but we can all create. The human race's creative power is distributed in all of us, not concentrated in some of us. Our creations are too great and too numerous to come from a few steps by a few people. They must come from many steps by many people. Invention is incremental, a series of slight and constant changes. Some changes open doors to new worlds of opportunity and we call them breakthroughs. Others are marginal, but when we look carefully, we will always find one small change leading to another sometimes within one mind, often among several, sometimes across continents or between generations, sometimes taking hours or days and occasionally centuries. The baton of innovation passing in an endless relay of renewal, creating accretes and compounds, and as a consequence, every day, each human life is made possible by the sum of all previous human creations. Every object in our life, however old or new, however apparently humble or simple, holds the stories, thoughts, and courage of thousands of people some living, most dead, the accumulated new of 50,000 years. Our tools and art are our humanity, our inheritance, and the everlasting legacy of our ancestors. The things we make are the speech of our species, stories of triumph, courage, and creation, of optimism, adaptation, and hope, tales not of one person here and there but of one people everywhere, written in a common language. Not African, American, Asian, or European but human. There are many beautiful things about creating being human and innate. One is that we all create in more or less the same way. Our individual strengths and tendencies of course cause differences, but they are small and few relative to the similarities, which are great and many. We are more like Leonardo, Mozart, and Einstein than not. Four, an end to genius the Renaissance belief that creating is reserved for genius survived through the enlightenment of the 17th century. 
the Romanticism of the 18th century, and the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. It was not until the middle of the 20th century that the alternative position, that everyone is capable of creation, first emerged from early studies of the brain. In the 1940s, the brain was an enigma. The body's secrets had been revealed by several centuries of medicine. But the brain, producing consciousness without moving parts, remained a puzzle. Here is one reason theories of creation resorted to magic. The brain, throne of creation, was three pounds of gray and impenetrable mystery. As the West recovered from World War II, new technologies appeared. One was the computer. This mechanical mind made understanding the brain seem possible for the first time. In 1952, Ross Ashby synthesized the excitement in a book called Design for a Brain. He summarized the new thinking elegantly. The most fundamental facts are that the Earth is over 2 billion years old and that natural selection has been winnowing the living organisms incessantly 16 as a result they are today highly specialized in the arts of survival. And among these arts has been the development of a brain, an organ that has been developed in evolution as a specialized means to survival. The nervous system, and living matter in general, will be assumed to be essentially similar to all other matter. No deus ex machina will be invoked. Put simply, brains don't need magic. The San Franciscan named Alan Newell came of academic age during this period 17 drawn by the energy of the era. He abandoned his plan to become a forest ranger, became a scientist instead, and then, one Friday afternoon in November 1954, experienced what he would later call a conversion experience during a seminar on mechanical pattern recognition. He decided to devote his life to a single scientific question. How can the human mind occur in the physical universe? We now know that the world is governed by physics, he explained, and we now understand the way biology nestles comfortably within that. The issue is how does the mind do that as well? The answer must have the details. I've got to know how the gears clank, how the pistons go and all of that. As he embarked on this work, Newell became one of the first people to realize that creating did not require genius. In a 1959 paper called The Processes of Creative Thinking, he reviewed what little psychological data there was about creative work then set out his radical idea. Creative thinking is simply a special kind of problem-solving behavior. He made the point in the understated language academics use when they know they are onto something. The data currently available about the processes involved in creative and non-creative thinking show no particular differences between the two 18 it is impossible to distinguish. By looking at the statistics describing the processes, the highly skilled practitioner from the rank amateur. Creative activity appears simply to be a special class of problem-solving activity characterized by novelty, unconventionality, persistence, and difficulty in problem formulation. It was the beginning of the end for genius and creation. Making intelligent machines forced new rigor on the study of thought. The capacity to create was starting to look more and more like an innate function of the human brain, possible with standard equipment. No genius necessary. Newell did not claim that everyone was equally creative. Creating, like any human ability, comes in a spectrum of competence. But everybody can do it. There is no electric fence between those who can create and those who cannot, with genius on one side and the general population on the other. Newell's work, along with the work of others in the artificial intelligence community, undermined the myth of creativity. As a result, some of the next generation of scientists started to think about creation differently. One of the most important of these was Robert Weisberg, a cognitive psychologist at Philadelphia's Temple University. Weisberg was an undergraduate during the first years of the artificial intelligence revolution, spending the early 1960s in New York before getting his PhD from Princeton and joining the faculty at Temple in 1967.19. He spent his career proving that creating is innate, ordinary, and for everybody. Weisberg's view is simple. He builds on Newell's contention that creative thinking is the same as problem solving then extends it to say that creative thinking is the same as thinking in general, but with a creative result. In Weisberg's words, when one says of someone that he or she is thinking creatively, one is commenting on the outcome of the process, not on the process itself. 20. Although the impact of creative ideas and products can sometimes be profound, the mechanisms through which an innovation comes about can be very ordinary. Said another way, normal thinking is rich and complex, so rich and complex that it can sometimes yield extraordinary or creative. Results, we do not need other processes. Weisberg shows this in two ways, with carefully designed experiments and detailed case studies of creative acts, from the painting of Picasso's Guernica to the discovery of DNA and the music of Billie Holiday. In each example, by using a combination of experiment and history, Weisberg demonstrates how creating can be explained without resorting to genius and great leaps of the imagination. Weisberg has not written about Edmund, but his theory works for Edmund's story. At first, Edmund's discovery of how to pollinate vanilla came from nowhere and seemed miraculous. But toward the end of his life, 
Ferial Bellier Beaumont revealed how the young slave solved the mystery of the black flower. Ferial began his story in 1793, when German naturalist Conrad Sprengel discovered that plants reproduced sexually. Sprengel called it the secret of nature. The secret was not well received. Sprengel's peers did not want to hear that flowers had a sex life 21 as findings spread anyway, especially among botanists and farmers who were more interested in growing good plants than in judging floral morality. And so Ferial knew how to manually fertilize watermelon by marrying the male and female parts together. He showed this to Edmund, who, as Ferial described it, later realized that the vanilla flower also had male and female elements, and worked out for himself how to join them together. Edmund's discovery, despite its huge economic impact, was an incremental step, and is no less creative as a result. All great discoveries, even ones that look like transforming leaps, are short hops. Weisberg's work, with subtitles like Genius and Other Myths and Beyond the Myth of Genius, did not eliminate the magical view of creation nor the idea that people who create are a breed apart. It is easier to sell secrets. Titles available in today's bookstores include 10 Things Nobody Told You About Being Creative, 39 Keys to Creativity, 52 Ways to Get and Keep Your Creativity Flowing, 62 Exercises to Unlock Your Most Creative Ideas, 100 What Ifs of Creativity, and 250 Exercises to Wake Up Your Brain. 22 Weisberg's books are out of print. 23 The Myth of Creativity Does Not Die Easily but it is becoming less fashionable, and Weisberg is not the only expert advocating for an epiphany-free, everybody-can theory of creation. Ken Robinson was awarded a knighthood for his work on creation and education and is known for the moving, funny talks he gives at an annual conference in California called TED. One of his themes is how education suppresses creation. He describes the really extraordinary capacity that children have, their capacity for innovation, and says that all kids have tremendous talents and we squander them, pretty ruthlessly. Robinson's conclusion is that creativity now is as important in education as literacy. And we should treat it with the same status 24 cartoonist Hugh MacLeod makes the same point more colorfully. Everyone is born creative. Everyone is given a box of crayons in kindergarten 25 being suddenly hit years later with the creative bug is just a wee voice telling you. I'd like my crayons back, please. 5. Termites if genius is a prerequisite for creating it should be possible to identify creative ability in advance. The experiment has been tried many times. The best-known version was started in 1921 by Lewis Terman and still continues 26 Terman. A cognitive psychologist born in the 19th century was a eugenicist who believed the human race could be improved with selective breeding, a classifier of individuals according to their abilities as he perceived them. His most famous classification system was the Stanford Binet IQ test which placed children on a scale ranging from idiocy on the one hand to genius on the other, with classifications in between including retarded, feeble-minded, delinquent, dull normal, average, superior, and very superior. Terman was so sure of his test accuracy that he thought its results revealed immutable destiny. He also believed, like all eugenicists, that African Americans, Mexicans, and others were genetically inferior to English-speaking white people. He described them as the world's hewers of wood and drawers of water who lacked the ability to be intelligent voters or capable citizens. The children, he said, should be segregated in special classes. The adults should not be allowed to reproduce. Unlike almost all eugenicists, Terman set out to prove his prejudices. His experiment was called Genetic Studies of Genius. It was a longitudinal study, meaning it would follow its subjects for a long period of time. It tracked more than 1,500 children who lived in California all of whom were identified as gifted by Terman's IQ test or some similar scheme. Nearly all the participants were white and from upper- or middle-class families. The majority of them were male. This is unsurprising. Of the 168,000 children considered for that pool of 1,500, only one was black. One was Indian, one was Mexican, and four were Japanese. The selectees, who had an average IQ of 151, called themselves termites. Data about the progress of their lives were collected every five years. After Terman died, in 1956, others took up his research, aiming to continue the work until the last participant either withdrew or died. Thirty-five years into the experiment, Terman proudly enumerated the success of his children, nearly 2,000 scientific and technical papers and articles and some 60 books and monographs in the sciences, literature, arts, and humanities. Patents granted amount to at least 230. Other writings include 33 novels, about 375 short stories, novelettes and plays, 60 or more essays, critiques and sketches, and 265 miscellaneous articles. Hundreds of publications by journalists that classify as news stories, editorials, or newspaper columns. Hundreds, if not thousands, of radio, television, 
or motion picture scripts. The identity of most of the termites is confidential. Around 30 have disclosed their participation. Some were notable creators. Jess Oppenheimer worked in television and was a principal developer of a top-ranked Emmy Award, winning comedy called I Love Lucy. Edward Dimitrick was a film director, making more than 50 Hollywood movies, including The Cane Mutiny, which was nominated for several Oscars, starred Humphrey Bogart, and was the second most watched film of 1954. Other participants fared less well. They found more ordinary work as policemen, technicians, truck drivers, and secretaries. One was a potter who was eventually committed to a mental hospital. Another cleaned swimming pools, several collected welfare. By 1947, Terman was forced to conclude, we have seen that intellect and achievement are far from perfectly correlated. This was despite Terman actively helping his participants by writing letters of recommendation and providing mentorship and references. Movie director Dimitrik benefited from a letter at age 14, after he ran away from his violent father. Terman explained to the Los Angeles juvenile authorities that Dimitrik was gifted and his case deserved special consideration. He was saved from his abusive childhood and placed into a good foster home. TV producer Oppenheimer was a coat salesman until Terman helped him get into Stanford University. Some termites landed careers in Terman's field of educational psychology, and many were admitted to Stanford, where he was an eminent professor. One termite took over the study after Terman died. The study's flaws and biases are beside the point. What matters is what happened to the children Terman excluded. A genius theory of creating predicts that the only creators among the children will be the ones Terman deemed geniuses. None of those excluded should have done anything creative, after all, they were not geniuses. This is where Terman's study falls flat. Terman did not create a control group of non-geniuses for comparison. We know a lot about the hundreds of children who were selected and only a little about the tens of thousands who were not. But what we do know is sufficient to undermine the genius theory. One child Terman considered and rejected was a boy named William Shockley. Another was a boy named Louis Alvarez. Both grew up to win Nobel Prizes for physics, Shockley for coinventing the transistor. Alvarez for his work in nuclear magnetic resonance. Shockley started Shockley Semiconductor, one of the first electronics companies in Silicon Valley. Employees of Shockley's went on to found Fairchild Semiconductor, Intel, and advanced micro devices. Working with his son Walter, Alvarez was the first to propose that an asteroid caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. The Alvarez hypothesis, which, after decades of controversy, scientists now accept as fact. Terman's failure to identify these innovators does not close the coffin on the genius hypothesis. Perhaps his definition of genius was insufficient or Shockley and Alvarez's tests were wrongly administered. But the magnitude of their achievements begs us to consider another conclusion. Genius does not predict creative ability because it is not a prerequisite. Subsequent studies tried to correct this by measuring creative ability specifically. Starting in 1958, Psychologist Ellis Paul Torrance administered a set of tests later known as the Torrance Tests of Creative Thinking to schoolchildren in Minnesota. Tasks included coming up with unusual ways to use a brick, having ideas for improving a toy, and improvising a drawing based on a given shape, such as a triangle. The researchers assessed the creative ability of each child by looking at how many ideas he or she generated, how different the ideas were from the others, how unusual they were, and how much detail they included. The difference in thinking about thinking that characterized psychology after World War II is evident in Torrance's work. Torrance suspected that creation was within the reach of everyday people in everyday life and eventually tried to modify his tests to eliminate racial and socioeconomic bias 27 unlike Terman. Torrance did not expect his method to be a reliable predictor of future outcomes. A high degree of these abilities does not guarantee that the possessor will behave in a highly creative manner, he wrote. A high level of these abilities, however, increases a person's chances of behaving creatively. How did these more modest expectations play out for Torrance's Minnesotan children? The first follow-up research came in 1966, using children who were tested in 1959. They were asked to select the three classmates who had the best ideas and then complete a questionnaire about their own creative work. The answers were compared with the data from seven years earlier. The correlation was not bad. It was certainly better than Terman's. The results were much the same after a second follow-up test in 1971. The Torrance test seemed to be a reasonable way to predict creative ability. The moment of truth came after 50 years, when the participants were ending their careers and had demonstrated whatever creative ability they possessed. The results were simple. 60 participants responded. None of the high-scoring individuals had created anything that had achieved public recognition. Many had done things Torrance and his followers called personal achievements of creation, such as forming an action group, building a house, or pursuing a creative hobby. The Torrance tests had achieved the modest goal of predicting who might have a somewhat creative life. 
they had done nothing to foresee who might have a creative career. Without meaning to, Torrance had done something else. He had reinforced what Terman's results showed but Terman stubbornly ignored. That genius has nothing to do with creative ability. Even when creative ability is broadly defined and generously measured, Torrance had recorded the IQ of all his participants. His results showed no connection between creative ability and general intelligence. Whatever Terman was measuring had nothing to do with creating, which is why he missed the Nobel laureates Shockley and Alvarez. We may call them creative geniuses now, but if creative genius is apparent only after creation, it is just another way of saying creative. 6. Ordinary acts The case against genius is clear. Too many creators. Too many creations. And too little predetermination. So how does creation happen? The answer lies in the stories of people who have created things. Stories of creation follow a path. Creation is destination, the consequence of acts that appear inconsequential by themselves, but that, when accumulated, change the world. Creating is an ordinary act, creation its extraordinary outcome. Was Edmund's story ordinary or extraordinary? If we could travel back to Ferial's estate in the reunion of 1841, we would see ordinary acts. A boy following an old man around a garden. A conversation about watermelons. The boy poking around inside a flower. If we returned in 1899, we would see an extraordinary outcome. The island transformed, the world transforming. Knowing the outcome tempts us to retrofit the acts with extraordinariness. To picture Edmund awake all night wrestling with the problem of pollination, having a moment of epiphany in the moonlight, and an enslaved 12-year-old orphan revolutionizing reunion and the world. But creation comes from ordinary acts. Edmund learned about botany through boyish curiosity and daily walks with Ferial. Ferial kept up with developments in the science of plants, including the work of Charles Darwin and Conrad Sprengel. Edmund applied this knowledge to vanilla, with the help of a bamboo tool and a child's small fingers. When we look behind creation's curtain, we find people like us doing things we can do. This does not make creating easy. Magic is instant, genius an accident of birth. Take them away and what is left is work. Work is the soul of creation. Work is getting up early and going home late, turning down dates and giving up weekends, writing and rewriting, reviewing and revising, wrote and routine, staring down the doubt of the blank page, beginning when we do not know where to start, and not stopping when we cannot go on. It is not fun, romantic, or, most of the time, even interesting. If we want to create, we must, in the words of Paul Gallico, open our veins and bleed 28 there are no secrets. When we ask writers about their process or scientists about their methods or inventors where they get their ideas from, we are hoping for something that doesn't exist, a trick, recipe, or ritual to summon the magic. An alternative to work. There isn't one. To create is to work. It is that easy and that hard. With the myth gone, we have a choice. If we can create without genius or epiphany, then the only thing stopping us from creating is us. There is an arsenal of ways to say no to creating. One, it is not easy, has already been addressed. It is not easy. It is work. Another is I have no time. But time is the great equalizer. The same for all, 24 hours every day. Seven days every week, every life a length unknown, for richest and poorest and all between. We mean we have no spare time, a blunt blade in a world whose best-selling literary series was begun by a single mother writing in Edinburgh's cafes when her infant daughter slept, where a career more than 50 novels long was started by a laundry worker in the furnace room of a trailer in Maine, where world-changing philosophy was composed in a Parisian jail by a prisoner awaiting the guillotine, and where three centuries of physics were overturned in a year by a man with a permanent position as a patent examiner 29, 30, 31, 32 there is time. The third no is the big one, the gun to the head of our dreams. Its endless variations all say the same thing. I can't. Here is the sour fruit of the myth that only the special can create. None of us think we are special, not in the middle of the night. When our faces flourish in the bathroom mirror, I can't, we say. I can't because I am not special. We are special, but that does not matter right now. What matters is that we do not have to be. The creativity myth is a mistake born of a need to explain extraordinary outcomes with extraordinary acts and extraordinary characters. A misunderstanding of the truth that creation comes from ordinary people and ordinary work. Special is not necessary. All that is necessary is to begin. A can is not true once we begin. Our first creative step is unlikely to be good. Imagination needs iteration. New things do not flow finished into the world. Ideas that seem powerful in the privacy of our head teeter weakly when we set them on our desk. But every beginning is beautiful. The virtue of a first sketch is that it breaks the blank page. It is the spark of life in the swamp. Its quality is not important. The only bad draft is the one we do not write. How to create. Why create. The rest of the book is about how and why. What to create. Only you can decide that. You may know. You may have an idea like an itch. But if you do not, don't worry. How and what are connected, one leads to the other.